Hey guys, how are you? So we've been working on the final final touches, if you will, to the new Studio Web 4 platform. If you don't know, this is my educational platform that I first prototyped about seven years ago. And over the years, based on the feedback we got from users and schools, we've been modifying the code base, adding to it, refining it. And over seven years, a huge amount has changed in terms of the core app, in terms of the use case. And because of that, because of multiple developers involved in the project, because of the change in terms of what the use case was for the project initially, uh, the code is, uh, shall we say, a little bit messy. So it's bug free now. It works really, really well. But to add to it, it's uh, messiness and the ad hoc um, nature of its development forced me to make that big decision. And that big decision was to do a rewrite from scratch. A rewrite from scratch is something you don't get into, you know, unless you really, really have to do it. It's a big, big job. On the other hand, when, you're, when you have an app, you have a program, it's well established like the studio web program where we know its use case we know what it needs to do intimately well and we understand what the bottlenecks are in terms of uh, the data processing and management and so forth we were able to architect the new app very very efficiently and effectively meaning from the database up to the frameworks that we chose etc cetera, etc cetera, was a, a much easier task this time around simply because we knew exactly what we needed. And that's a big part of the process of building an app. You may think that you have exactly what you need initially, but any experienced developer will tell you is when you get out there in the real world, then you start really seeing what it is your app needs to be to actually be effective in the world. You got to get that feedback. That's why there's Windows 10, not just Windows 1. That's why there's Mac OS 10, not Mac OS 1. That's why you have multiple versions of iOS and Android, because with each year that you have your software out there being used by people, the more you learn about what it is it needs to do and how it needs to do it. Anyway, so we were working on Studio Web 4, re-rate from scratch, starting about eight, nine months ago. And we're so close to it being done. One of the things we did was to redesign the structure of the database so it's more optimized, if you will, given the use case. So we restructured the tables, etc. Now, the current lead developer, who's been working with me for about two years now, he had intimate knowledge of Studio Web 3, which is the current production version. And so he was obviously the best choice for Studio Web 4. And that was actually my plan. I brought him in to become super familiar with Studio Web 3 to do the last uh, changes we need to do to, we needed to do to it in terms of uh, adding in new features, squashing a few remaining bugs. But his experience working with Studio Web 3 made him the perfect choice to do Studio Web 4 because he knew he knew that code, he knew that that program. So one of the things he did wisely was uh, he spent time designing and structuring the relational database, the SQL-based database, properly. What does that mean? He made sure that we utilize the features of relational databases. That means putting in uh, referential keys, uh, putting in the um, structure to the database, that would protect the integrity of the data that we were storing. I'm trying to avoid the specifics here because I'm assuming you got some people who are new to the game. You see, one of the advantages of using relational databases and well-established databases is that they have all kinds of features and functionality built into them. So an RDBMS, Relational Database Management System, is a very sophisticated piece of software. And this software allows you to store data. And you got examples like MySQL and SQL Server. The biggest, I think, is probably Oracle. And there's many others out there, Postgre, etc. And so what these 
uh, programs have for you, what these servers have for you, these database services, is, is all kinds of capability that helps you to manage the data and to ensure the integrity and the consistency in the data. So not just in production, not just when you are running your code, but actually in development. So with Studio Web 4, case in point, we are, we're on the final stages. And just last week, we were working on some stuff. And I said, you know, we need to we need to add a couple of little minor features, but these features would impact the database. So the lead developer implemented this stuff. And then when we went to do some testing, the database threw some errors and prevented the app from doing what we wanted it to do. It blocked it. And the reason the database blocked our code is because the database said, no, 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 if you do this, you're going to break uh, the integrity of the data that we're storing here. We're going to cause some problems. And so it prevented uh, the queries from being uh, operated upon the database. Let me say that again. It basically blocked the app's code from doing any changes to the database because the database said, no, 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 we set up some rules here. And if you do this, you're going you're gonna to break stuff. And this was very cool because what, did, what this did, what this did, is it prevented us from injecting inadvertently some minor cryptic little error into our data. Now, this may have not shown up right away. That's the thing about these type of errors. It may have only showed up, you know, 100,000 records later, 200,000 records later. And at that point, it could be trouble. And so one of the advantages of spending the time to sit down, spend that extra hour or so to design your database structure, well, depending on the size, it could be several hours, it could be 20 minutes, depending on how simple your app is or how complex it is. But spending that extra time to structure your database, to put in the foreign keys, to put in the primary keys, to set up the relationships between the data uh, and tables in your database can pay off in big dividends. This is something I think that a lot of developers don't want to do. They look at databases and they don't want to learn about database, relational database structure and logic and things like normalizations and compound key and foreign key constraints and all kinds of other things that are so important because yes, they can be a headache at first to implement, to put into place. But once they're there, it's kind of like having a sentinel, a guard protecting the integrity of your data. Now, you, it's obviously you can protect things in production, but it, actually it's very useful in terms of ongoing development. Because if you spend your time, you design your database, you protect, you have all your database constraints in place, all the protections to protect the data. If you're making changes, as you will with any software, there's always changes to be made. This will protect you from inadvertently damaging your data. That's a big, big problem. So i rather have a little bit more work up front to put in these protections utilizing the databases built-in capabilities than to uh, ignore it ignore don't put in don't not putting the time rather into these things and then finding some real major problem with your data down the road back when i was much more active as a java developer that was one of the big debates between and one of the big battles, if you will, between the DBAs, the database administrators, versus the uh, app developers, the software developers. The developers tend to, whatever reasons, not want to uh, learn too much about databases. They just want to do everything in the code. So what I remember what was happening at that time, uh, the Java developers, we're not a monolith, but a lot of them, they had this idea of they would just use databases, relational databases, as 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 dumb dumb storage, if you will. They wouldn't, they didn't want to use the built-in capabilities of the database. So they would just use them in a very superficial way, for lack of better words. And so, for example, they would they would just execute maybe a a, a very big query from the database, pulling in a huge blob of records over the. Uh, over the network, whether it be the internet or a local network. And then they would use Java to massage that data, then present it and do what they needed to do. Now, what I used to argue 
is that it was kind of silly to do that when you had programs like these database management systems like MySQL, like Oracle, like SQL Server, that had all kinds of capabilities built into them that allow you to much more effectively manage your data. So let me give you a simple example. A simple example is using something called a stored procedure or stored proc. Now, a stored proc is basically just a query that's been cached and compiled in your database server. And instead of firing off, for instance, a select statement, a basic query to the database, and then the database would receive the query from your Java layer, or from your Python layer, or from your JavaScript layer, or from your PHP layer, it would receive this database query, uh, say an, an SQL select statement, and then it would then take that query, process it, and then give you back the results all in real time. People do it all the time. It's great. What stored procedures allow you to do, it allows you to store a database query and then have the database engine to compile it and optimize this query. So what happens is that you get a much faster and quicker result coming out of your database because it's just pre-compiled. So this is a very simple example, but even using stored procedures was like a lot of developers didn't want to use them. They felt that they were tying themselves into the database. And one of the things I, I, I argued, it's a rare thing to switch from one database to the next. It happens, but it's rare. I've done it once or twice in my career, but it's a rare thing. And uh, so I always argued, use stored procedures if you see that it could speed up your queries. Another thing you could do is use something called a view. A view is another, it's like a virtual table that allows you, again, to more easily sort information, retrieve information from your database without having to do it in your business logic code, in your Java code, in your PHP code, in your Python code, whatever language you want to use. Anyway, these are just two quick examples. The thing to take away from this is that when you're looking at databases, I would really strongly, strongly suggest that you learn a little bit about the built-in tools, the powerful tools that you find in database systems. They can be very useful in terms of keeping your uh, app in good shape, meaning keeping your data in good shape. It could be very useful in terms of performance and scaling, where you can do some simple things to optimize your database structure and you can have a huge, huge performance gains. And I've talked about that where with I was a year or so ago with Studio Web 3. Uh, we were having major issues with performance because we had more and more users getting on board. It was taking up a lot of juice. So the developer at the time, uh, he wasn't so database centric. And I said to him, did you index the tables? He said, yeah, the tables are indexed. Okay, fine. The tables are indexed. Now, indexing is a process of um, optimization, if you will. It basically, it's very easy to, to apply an index into your relational databases and um, it could speed up your database tremendously. An index is just like, think of like an index in the book. Instead of trying to flip through every page in the book to find what you're looking for, you go to the index and you can find what you're looking for much more easily. So in a relational database, when you tell the database you want to apply an index to a particular table, and I won't get into specifics here, but when you tell it to do that, it basically optimizes, it creates an index from that table, from that particular uh, set of data that you want to optimize. I'm trying to avoid jargon here. And uh, as a result, every time you hit that table, you do your basic type of queries, your basic type of uh, uh, retrieval of information, you're going to have a huge performance gain. And to apply, uh, to apply an index to a database table is really, really quick and easy. You have to be careful sometimes because sometimes you can slow down things, but a lot of the times you'll really speed up things. Anyway, so we had some speed problems with Studio Web 3. And so, so my developer at the time, was, he was saying to me, the lead, he was saying, yeah, yeah, we've applied the indexes. So I said, okay, fine, we applied the indexes. So let's try and uh, speed things up. So we created, uh, we implemented another ARM object relational mapping software created a, a dedicated microservices-based app, used it to 
parse data, and we sent JSON objects back to the original app, and which sped up things quite a bit. It was a big process, though. And, but still, as the app got more popular, more and more users on board, it started slowing down more and more and more and more. And I started adding resources to it in terms of server resources. Fortunately, I was uh, in a cloud-based hosting. I used cloud-based hosting, so I was able to add CPU, add RAM on the fly. That's one of the advantages of cloud-based hosting. You can scale vertically quite easily, and with modern-day stuff, even more sophisticated you can scroll, you can scale horizontally, a whole different story. Point, point is, when you do cloud-based hosting, it's easy to increase the power of your server. It's very simple compared to what it used to be. Anyway, so I was increasing the power of the server to try to keep up with demand. And at what point I was spending, I don't know what it was, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month or more on hosting. This is like pumping a lot of power uh, to maintain this bloody thing. And I was like, wow, this thing is like, we got a major problem here. And I said to myself, wow, I can't, I can't be. There's got to be a problem. It can't be. And at, anyway, at this point, we had the new developer, new lead developer involved. So I sat down with him. I, I, I told him, hey, we're having all these problems with the system. The system's running really slow. We've got we to figure something out here. So he went into it, and he came back, and he said, you know, the tables are not indexed properly. There's some, you know, there could be more work done there. I said, really? Yeah, yeah. He said, you know. And he pointed out how this, you know, said this table, is, it's, the index is not really replied properly. And I looked at it, and sure enough, it wasn't. So I, I spent about 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was, maybe half an hour, making sure, because it had been a long time since I applied indexes myself, make sure everything was cool. And then I just applied the index, which took all of, like, you know, 20 seconds. And all of a sudden, the app became, like, 10,000 times faster. It was incredible. The whole thing was just sped up like crazy. And I was able to reduce my uh, resource uh, needs for my server by 95%, 90%. So it was, it was in, an incredible thing. Just with a simple little bit of database optimization, I was able to breathe new life into this, uh, into the software. And to this day, I'm still, I have, uh, it's much bigger still, and it's running just fine, just fine. So there you go. Don't ignore the database. A lot of people, a lot of developers, I think, do. They don't want to touch it, but there's a lot of gains to be had by just having a properly set up and optimized database where you got your controls put into place to prevent you from corrupting your data or messing with your data and in terms of optimizations as well. I hope you found this interesting. Bye-bye.